I'm going to take up the first law of thermodynamics, uh, and from there we'll look at uh, calorimetry as a um, method for measuring the value of delta E for a particular reaction. Okay. Uh, so the first law of thermodynamics really uh, is a conservation of energy statement. Uh, the energy of the universe is constant is one way to declare the first law in words. Okay. Uh, the universe uh, is broken down into two things. The system, uh, generally uh, loosely defined as the part of the universe we care about, uh, and the surroundings, which is uh, everything else, the things that are not the focus of uh, our uh, current thought. Okay, uh, for our purposes, the system is generally going to be, uh, as I've said before, the collection of atoms or molecules that are in the chemical reaction we're looking at. Okay, because energy of the universe is constant. If I take the change in energy for the system, which is labeled here as delta E uh, for the system, uh, and add that with delta E for the surroundings, they have to sum to zero. Basically, if the system is gaining energy, it has to come from the surroundings. If the system is giving off energy, it has to go to the surroundings. Okay, that idea should uh, be fairly intuitive. Okay. Uh, when we focus on the system part, because that's the part of the universe that we're interested in, right? So we generally don't want to think about the surroundings because that, at least strictly speaking, is everything else that uh, is, is anywhere in the literal universe. Uh, we can say that uh, the system can gain or lose energy in two ways. Uh, those are heat and work. Okay, so we say delta E for the system uh, is Q plus W. Uh, oftentimes we don't write the system subscript there, right? So usually we'll just see this written as saying delta E is equal to Q plus W, where the system is implied. Uh, e is a state function, that's why it's in an uppercase letter. Uh, Q and W, where the heat and work there, are conspicuously written as lowercase letters. That's because those two are not state functions. Okay, uh, It works out that uh, the sum of those uh, is always uh, path independent, but the individual values would change if we change the pathway uh, that we went uh, through some cycle. Uh, the easiest way to prove that is by doing things with an ideal gas, uh, which some of you, if you take a thermal course uh, in the future, will probably work through that. Right now, though, we want to move on and just talk about uh, what's uh, what is in this equation, right? We've talked about heat. Uh, we talked about heat capacities, uh, said we can measure the heat flow by measuring changes in temperature, right? Uh, so now we're going to talk for just a few minutes about work. Uh, the thermodynamic uh, definition of work is its energy transfer uh, accomplished by a force uh, moving through some distance, okay? Uh, force times distance is equal to work. That's the, uh, the thermodynamic uh, statement for this. Uh, how does that uh, does that work out? Let's see. Force uh, is is uh, say that would be in uh, what in uh, newtons. Say if we were in SI units, and distance would be in meters. Newtons times meters would be joules. Uh, so we get energy units, right? Uh, and so work has uh, has the units of energy. Uh, one thing that's clear from this definition is if, if nothing is moving, uh, if the distance goes to zero, right, uh, then the work would go to zero. So no work is done uh, if nothing moves. A reasonable question right now is what kind of work, how does work get done in a, in a chemical reaction, right? Does work get done in a chemical reaction or is it uh, in fact just zero if we have a reaction all taking place in some static container? Uh, the answer to that question is that uh, the work we consider in reactions uh, most frequently is what is uh, often referred to as PV work or pressure volume work. Uh, this is work having to do with the expansion or compression of a gas, okay? Uh, imagine that I do a reaction, uh, I don't know, in uh, early on in the semester I did a demonstration or I played a tape of a demonstration uh, where uh, we dissolved magnesium and hydrochloric acid uh, and it made hydrogen gas, right? Uh, and if you remember that, uh, that little video clip, uh, there were some magnesium pellets in a balloon, I flipped them into the, or someone flipped them into the, the flask and the balloon inflated, right? Uh, so when that balloon inflated, that meant the volume of our collection of atoms uh, was, it was increasing, right? It was uh, going up and filling the balloon. In order to do that, it had to push away the surrounding atmosphere uh, to uh, take over that volume. Okay, so in that case, uh, our gas expanded and we would say the gas actually did work against the atmosphere because it pushed away uh, the surroundings, okay. Uh, the way to calculate this work of expansion or, or compression is that uh, if the external pressure is constant, uh, the work is equal to minus the external pressure times the change in volume, okay. Uh, Delta V is just the volume at the end minus the volume at the beginning, right? Uh, so if we have expansion, in the case of expansion, then delta V is positive, uh, and therefore work uh, is uh, negative, right? In the case of compression, uh, then we have uh, delta V uh, is negative, 
because that means the volume at the end is smaller than the volume at the beginning, right? So the uh, end minus the beginning then will be a, a negative quantity. If delta V is negative, uh, that tells us that then the work will be positive. Okay, uh, those signs, uh, I'll come back and talk about those uh, in a moment. Okay, uh, and also if delta V is zero, then uh, as expected, if our volume doesn't change, then no work is done. Okay, uh, that means the work cont contribution is generally going to be important only for systems where we have uh, we have gases involved, and typically when we have different numbers of moles of gas on the the two sides of the equation, that's where the volume change will be the greatest, uh, and uh, that's where the work part would be the most important. In terms of units, uh, if I have uh, pressure over here, remember pressure is force over area. Right, force per unit area is the definition of pressure. Uh, and so if I multiply that by volume, uh, volume divided by area is distance. So this thing is force times distance. And that's what we said work should be, right? Uh, so our units uh, are consistent when we do that, okay. Uh, and so that's the work that normally is important in chemical reactions. There are some other cases, gosh, if we think about reactions going on in a battery, we could think about electrical work, uh, but uh, we're not uh, generally gonna be considering that uh, for our purposes here. Another couple words about the signs on Q and W. Okay, this is an important thing. One of the ways that people have uh, get in trouble in thermodynamics problems is by getting the signs uh, twisted around. Okay, uh, work is uh, defined the way we have the equation set up. Work is defined as being positive when work is done on the system. Right. Uh, think about it. If uh, the work is being done on the system, that means my system is being compressed. That means the world is is squeezing in on it. Uh, that amounts to a flow of energy into the system. Right. Uh, if, on the other hand, if the uh, system is doing the work, then it's pushing out, it's spending some energy to move the surroundings out of the way. Right. So that's energy flowing out. Uh, so positive work is work done on the system. Uh, positive Q is when heat is added to the system, flowing in. Right. Uh, the general purpose of these conventions is to make sure that anything that's energy going into the system uh, gets a positive sign. Anything that's energy coming out from the system should get a negative sign. OK, uh, it's uh, it's really important to keep those straight and uh, make things uh, work that way. Uh, I will warn you, there are occasionally places uh, where one can encounter uh, some uh, places that use the opposite sign convention and then the, the signs in the equations shift. Uh, it's really disconcerting if you uh, stumble into a uh, situation that's like that. But the way we're doing this is the way that most people do the signs in thermodynamics. All right, uh, so we wanted to talk about calorimetry as a way to measure uh, the, the change in energy we hope for a chemical reaction, okay? Uh, so when I say calorimetry, what we're actually measuring is a temperature change, okay? Uh, temperature change is an easily measurable uh, lab thing. All we need to do is have our reaction take place in some sort of controlled fashion uh, and have a thermometer of some sort that can measure the temperature of the reacting system, okay? Uh, if we measure the temperature change, and if we know the heat capacities of all the things involved, we should be able to convert the temperature change uh, into a, a heat, right? Uh, and so what we're going to look at now is uh, what exactly that heat can tell us. So when we do a reaction, like I said, in controlled conditions, uh, there are two main ways this is done. One is at constant volume, uh, and one is at constant pressure. Okay, uh, in, uh, in this video, I'm gonna talk about calorimetry at constant volume. That's the one that is actually conceptually a little bit simpler from where we're starting, okay? Uh, that would happen, we'd have to have a closed container and I'll show you a picture of a container that uh, could do this uh, in a moment, All right? Uh, also, we sometimes do constant pressure calorimetry and I'll talk about that one in a subsequent video. Uh, I think at the very end of the semester this year, you have a, a lab uh, experiment you'll see which involves constant pressure calorimetry. Uh, constant pressure case is easier, frankly. Uh, when you do see that, the, that, that lab in the online lab, you will see that uh, the calorimeter in that case is uh, literally just a couple of styrofoam coffee cups stacked together uh, because it can be open to the atmosphere if we're just going for constant pressure, okay? Constant volume is a little bit harder to do, but it's in some ways easier to think about. So if we measure the change in temperature, we should be able to find Q, the heat, if we know the heat capacities of things. Now we have to figure out whether that, what that heat actually corresponds to. So this is uh, some uh, pictures here of constant uh, volume calorimeters, what is called a bomb calorimeter. Uh, this piece here uh, is, uh, this is a uh, photo uh, of what would be called the bomb. 
uh, in a bomb calorimeter. Okay, uh, in uh, in live class, I actually have one of those that sits in my office that I usually bring to class. Uh, I can tell you that, uh, gosh, the can part, uh, this uh, this piece here, uh, that thing is probably about I don't know six or seven inches tall. Uh, it weighs uh, probably eight or ten pounds because it's it's made out of some very thick walled uh, stainless steel, uh, and uh, you can see it's got a lot of threads on the top of it. That's because when the cap screws on, it's got to screw on very tightly uh, because uh, it's important that the volume of that container is not going to change, even if we do a reaction inside there that produces some gas uh, where it might build up to very high pressures. It has to not explode or not uh, just uh, expand out like a balloon when that happens. Uh, that's why uh, this is actually the, the much more elaborate and expensive way to do calorimetry, because uh, that, uh, that container in the picture there probably uh, would cost a few thousand dollars to buy, uh, which obviously is not what a couple of styrofoam cups cost to buy. This picture over here just says uh, that container, when it's all screwed together and got the sample in there and stuff, uh, then it would get dunked in a bucket like the picture on the right, uh, which would be filled with water. And there's a motor up there which is just going to stir the water so everything is uh, held at the same temperature, right? So the temperature is uniform uh, throughout there. My actual stuff to react would be put uh, in that little cup there, uh, and then uh, it would sit on, there's a loop on that piece there. Uh, some wires would come down that would be like a spark plug that would actually like ignite the reaction. Uh, and say, if we were doing a combustion reaction, we'd put a sample of something we were going to burn in there. We'd pump the can full of oxygen, and then we'd uh, trigger the, the spark plug from the outside, and it would uh, set off the reaction. So let's look at the equations for what happens when we do this. Uh, delta E is Q plus W, right? That's the first law of thermodynamics. We just declared that. Uh, the work is minus external pressure times delta V. Uh, if my uh, thick-walled calorimeter does its job, delta V is zero, right? If delta V is zero, then the work is zero, because uh, whatever the external pressure is, somewhere around one atmosphere, presumably, uh, the work is still zero, because delta V is zero. Uh, if work is zero, then delta E is just Q. So we write that delta E is equal to Q, uh, and where we write it as Q sub V, <clears throat> because that equation there is only true if the volume is constant, right? If the volume changes, uh, then the work term goes back to being non-zero. Uh, and so whenever we write the delta E equals Q, we usually put the sub V on there to, to make sure it's clear that that's a, a special case uh, equation, okay? Uh, so if I do a reaction at constant volume uh, in a calorimeter, I'm going to measure delta E, okay? So when I say I'm going to measure the temperature change, uh, there would actually be, in addition to the stirrer and stuff, there's a thermometer, a uh, temperature sensor built into the uh, the container here, or the, the bucket, uh, that's going to have everything inside there, right? So it's stirring the water, uh, the water and the, the steel uh, container and the stuff inside the steel container are all going to be at the same temperature. Uh, well, they're all going to be at the same temperature eventually, right? When the reaction first happens, it's going to liberate heat inside the container, the inner walls of the container are going to start to get hot, but that's going to then propagate out. Uh, and so we're going to get a temperature change for the whole collection of things. Uh, the water in the bucket, uh, the uh, metal container, the stuff inside the container, all those things are going to be changing temperature, right? If we know the heat capacities of everything, we should still be able to figure out uh, what the uh, actual uh, amount of energy that uh, was involved is. So let's, uh, I think we're going to do an example problem like this. It says uh, we're going to burn uh, two tenths of a gram of glucose. Uh, just think sugar, right? Uh, that's it's not exactly table sugar, but it is a sugar. Uh, two tenths of a gram of glucose. We're going to burn it in excess oxygen at constant volume. So in one of those uh, those uh, calorimeters, like was just in the picture. The temperature of the calorimeter, meaning of everything there, right? That would be the temperature of the bucket with the water in it, with the stuff inside it. Uh, so the temperature I measure there goes up by three degrees when this happens. That bucket is well insulated uh, so that uh, we think all the heat's going to be trapped in there, okay? I get a temperature change of three degrees uh, when I burn my two-tenths of a gram. Uh, my goal is going to be to find delta E for the combustion of one mole of glucose. And uh, there's a note down here on the bottom which says the heat capacity of the calorimeter is uh, that quantity there, okay? Uh, that thing is sometimes called a calorimeter constant. Uh, it's probably bothering a number of you right now because it says it's a heat capacity. Uh, it's got units of uh, kilojoules per degree C, right? Uh, it does not have a mass or a mole unit on it like heat capacities that we saw uh, in, in the uh, earlier video. The reason for that is this is the heat capacity of 
a particular object, uh, not of a material, right? Uh, so if I flip back to the other slide for a second, if this was my calorimeter, uh, and if I worked with this calorimeter every day, my job was to, I don't know, maybe check the uh, calorie ratings on, on food products or something like that. Uh, so I break off a little bit of cookie and throw it in there and burn it uh, and uh, figure out how many calories of, of uh, energy that liberates. Uh, that would be a boring job, but uh, that's one that, uh, that we could do with such a calorimeter. Uh, I would say that heat capacity is going to be for the stainless steel container, for that container sitting in however much water it takes to fill up the bucket of water that the thing is in, right? And if I worked with this same calorimeter over and over again, eventually I would realize that it was easier to just say, I could get the heat capacity of just all of my stuff altogether, instead of saying I have this many grams of stainless steel and this many grams of water and this many grams of whatever else is involved, right? I could just add them all together and get a heat capacity for the object. Uh, so if you really want there to be a, a quantity unit on here, uh, you could say uh, it's this much, uh, say, per calorimeter, and you only have one calorimeter, right? Just from a unit standpoint, if you take that thing and if you tried to do like an, an N or MC delta T uh, with that, uh, instead of getting to energy units, you're going to get to uh, mass or mole units then, right? Because you're, uh, you're going to have those stick around because your delta T would take care of the degrees C, but then you'd have like gram kilojoules or mole kilojoules, and that would be awkward. All right, let's do the problem. Uh, so uh, this is my, uh, my information, right? Uh, oh, that's not right. Dang it, that's not Q for the calorimeter, that's the heat capacity for the calorimeter. So let's turn that Q into a C. Uh, so what am I gonna do? I'm gonna say when I burn my uh, two tenths of a gram of uh, glucose, uh, the first thing I'm gonna say is the temperature went up, right? Uh, it also said I'm doing a combustion reaction, I'm burning sugar, right? This should be a source of energy. So when I get a value for delta E, it better be negative because I've gotta be releasing energy when I burn the sugar. Okay, uh, so that's my, uh, that's my starting point, is that I want it to turn out that way. Uh, let's find how much heat went into the calorimeter, okay? Uh, so now I'm going to find what really will be Q for the calorimeter. And uh, that's equal to C for the calorimeter uh, times delta T for the calorimeter. Right? And we have both of those numbers. Uh, C for the calorimeter is 1.56 kilojoules per degree C. Uh, delta T is three degrees C. Uh, so if I multiply those things, I get 4.68 kilojoules. Gosh, it's been a while since I got to do problems with numbers in them, so it's kind of exciting. Uh, so this is Q for the calorimeter. That's how much energy flows into my steel container and the bucket of water it's sitting in and all that stuff, right? So that same amount of energy had to flow out from the reaction. So I could write that Q for the calorimeter has got to be equal to minus Q uh, for the glucose or for the reaction, okay? I mean, the glucose is kind of gone now, so calling it Q for the glucose is probably a bad idea, but I should put maybe reaction there, okay? Uh, so this tells me that Q, uh, this time I'm going to change this to say Q for my reaction, because I like that better. Sorry for changing terms right in the middle of the problem. Uh, must be equal to minus 4.68 kilojoules. But that's Q, that's how much heat was liberated when I burned two tenths of a gram of glucose. Suppose I had burned a whole gram of glucose instead, right? Uh, if I burned more fuel, I should get more energy. Right? Uh, and so I have to somehow scale this because I want to now do it pretending I had burned a mole of glucose, right? Uh, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that I got uh, this many uh, uh, kilojoules, 4.68 kilojoules were released when I burned 0.2 grams of glucose. So we're going to normalize for that. We're going to say that delta E if I wanted it to be in per gram, uh, I could say that I got uh, minus, I'm, I'm putting minus there to keep the sign intact, right? I could figure that out again at the end if I want. I know heat's being liberated. Uh, 4.68 kilojoules. Uh, that was for 0.2 grams of uh, glucose but I don't want it to be per gram, I want it to be per mole. 
So we get to do something we haven't done for a while, uh, which is if I take uh, C6 H12 O6 and add that up, uh, it turns out there are 180 grams, and you can check me on that if you want, uh, 180 grams of glucose is one mole. And then uh, if I uh, just multiply that one out, then I get a result that says I get minus 4,000 212 uh, kilojoules per mole. And that is now my delta E for burning a mole of glucose, right? So that's what the question said I wanted to find uh, was what would the value be if I burned a whole mole? Uh, the part at the end, which says obviously the 4,000 kilojoules is a lot more than the four kilojoules we started with. That's because I burned just a little bit, right? Two tenths of a gram is, uh, is nowhere near the 180 grams that was a mole, right? Uh, it should make intuitive sense that uh, if I burn more stuff, if it's releasing energy, the more stuff I burn, the more energy I release, right? Uh, if I, uh, my fire will get a lot hotter if I throw more wood on it, right? Because I've got more heat uh, coming out of there if I'm burning more fuel uh, in the same uh, window of time, okay? Uh, and so that, that idea should make sense to you. It's a little bit like doing stoichiometry uh, where uh, this thing, the kilojoules per mole that we have over there, uh, that's delta E for burning one mole of it. That would help us figure out how much heat we could get if we burned any arbitrary amount uh, of the glucose, okay? All right, uh, that's an example of a constant volume calorimetry problem. Uh, in, uh, in the next video, we'll talk about what happens if we do the reaction instead at constant pressure, and that'll let us meet up with another uh, thermodynamic function known as enthalpy.